when the Adirondack Park was created in 1892 by the state of New York, this diverse mountain landscape was a wild place, full of pristine waterways, boreal forests, and towering mountains. It was land ripe for cultivation or conservation, and on the brink of widespread deforestation. Clearcutting was a growing concern in the late 1800s, but in 1894, the Adirondack Forest Preserve was established as a constitutionally protected forever wild area. Of the Adirondack Park 6 million acres, 3 million acres are designated forever wild and owned by New York State. The remaining 3 million acres are privately owned. The Adirondack region is the largest publicly protected area in the contiguous United States and is home to 105 towns and villages. A common misperception is that the Adirondack Park is a national park, yet the region's mix of public and private land is administered by New York State and the Adirondack Park Agency, allowing for conservation and civilization to thrive together. Within this very large park are some 4,000 lakes and ponds. Adirondack lakes vary enormously in their size, watersheds, depth, bottom type, chemistry, temperature, aquatic organisms, elevation, and position in the terrain. Many of the Adirondack parks, lakes, and ponds have excellent water quality, and many are located in pristine wilderness areas. Some Adirondack lakes and ponds have been affected by long-range transport of pollutants from Midwest power plants, leading to acidification and accumulation of nitrogen and mercury. While acidification has improved in recent years, nitrogen and mercury deposition are still concerns, especially for watersheds in the southwestern portion of the park and in the high peaks, where prevailing winds from the Midwest deposit the most deposition. Glaciers had a hand in lake and pond development. In areas with extensive outwash, stranded ice blocks became depressions, also called kettle holes, where they melted. Some that intersected groundwater, or those with a waterproof bottom, became ponds. Our lakes and ponds can be classified by their source of water. Drainage lakes derive their water from groundwater, which comes from rain and snowmelt, or from river runoff where river water is pooled by a dam. Seepage lakes have no inlet or outlet and derive their water from surface water runoff, groundwater, and precipitation. Spring-fed lakes and ponds derive their water from springs and seeps. To a great extent, the story of lakes and ponds is a story of dams, both human and beaver made. Almost all of the large lakes in the Adirondacks were dammed in the 19th and 20th centuries to achieve their present size and shape. Dams raised water levels in these lakes and created features including so-called flowed lands with dead snags and floating wetlands or bogs. Beavers now at an all-time high population level, create and modify ponds extensively throughout the landscape. Beaver dams come and go, sometimes on a regular cycle, so water bodies behind them are very dynamic. Lakes can also be described based on their level of productivity. Low productivity lakes are called oligotrophic, and are characterized by having relatively clear water, low dissolved nutrients, and sparse algae and other plant growth. These lakes are often rich in oxygen throughout the year. High productivity lakes, called eutrophic, are characterized by having darker waters, high levels of dissolved nutrients, and often dense algae and other plant growth. They are teeming with life, sometimes to such an excess that the lake is said to eutrophy and stagnate. 
This can lead to depletion of oxygen throughout the lake, resulting in fish kills and aggressive growth of aquatic plants. Medium productivity lakes, also known as mesotrophic, are intermediate between the oligotrophic and eutrophic lakes. Adirondack lakes and ponds can host cold water fish communities like native brook trout and a few rare strains of brook trout found only in a single lake, thus endemic to that lake. Many other native dace and minnows can be part of such a fish community. Other lakes and ponds, particularly eutrophic lakes, host warm water fish communities that include northern pike, smallmouth bass, yellow perch, brown bullhead, and various sunfish. The iconic Adirondack bird species, the common loon, is dependent on a good source of fish for a healthy diet. There are also non-native fish, considered invaders, like the largemouth bass. Even though the area started from a fishless state 13,000 years ago when the glaciers melted, it is difficult to ascertain which species are native to the region, and precisely when they migrated back in. Official and unofficial stocking confuses the issue. Lake and pond ecosystems are in a slow state of flux, as they adjust to new introductions of organisms and changes to hydrology and temperature induced by climate change. Will these lakes and forests be the same a hundred years from now? It will depend to a great extent on our efforts to control the deposition of airborne pollutants like nitrogen and mercury, already limiting reproduction of the loon, and further impacts of greenhouse gases and temperature rise which will cause a slow evolution of Adirondack forests. Pests and pathogens, like the woolly edelgid, may decimate streamside hemlock trees, leading to a rise in river and stream temperatures, removing cold water refuges for brook trout where they spawn. Temperature rise will affect cold water layers in deeper lakes, where slow growing lake trout harbor during warmer portions of the summer and raise water temperatures in the shallows where lake trout normally spawn. Increasing lake water temperatures will also cause changes to the composition and distribution of aquatic plant communities. This video shows you many of the 4,000 lakes of the Adirondack Park filmed during the summer of 2016. Depending on our response to dynamic threats like climate change and airborne pollutants, they may or may not look the same in a hundred or two hundred years. <laughs>